we go into this offseason, and Rudy Gobert was the biggest shocker. Uh, the Timberwolves make the trade. They give away five first-round draft for picks. The, for yeah. the finesse. Yeah, for, well, for Rudy. Danny Danny likes to rip people off, as we all know. <laughs> I, I mean, we you know, his last name is Ainge. I, I would say uh, – I would say Danny Cheapo Ainge, I would say, because he, he he has been robbing people since the beginning with the, you know, obviously the Nets trade, and uh, that's yes. where he's become the more popular uh, GM, a.k.a. president of a team. But, Why do people still answer the phone when he calls? I don't know, because he's If got, I see Danny Ainge calling my line, I'm not picking it up. No, because he's going to rip you off. And, and I the same thing, everybody knows that Donovan Mitchell wants to be a Nick. And, uh, and and the Knicks are the only team right now that could probably make that move because Miami can't because they can't fit his salary in there unless they trade away a bunch of pieces. And, and they don't have enough prospect, prospects like the Knicks. Nobody do. wants a package no. around Tyler Hero. No, I so – so there's nothing. So the Knicks are the so the Knicks are going to be betting against themselves. But knowing Danny Ainge, because they he has that little toy, he's going to dangle it until he gets what he wants. So if I were the Knicks, I'd just sit back and let him, you know, let him choke because he knows that Donovan Mitchell doesn't want to be there. Donovan knows he doesn't want to be there. So mm-hmm. the Knicks just have to sit still, realize that nobody else is out there to give him what he wants, and and the Knicks will give yeah. him the draft there's, stock there's no that hurt. they want. No. And I, I think that's what's, that's why everybody keeps thinking that this trade could could probably take the rest of the offseason before it happens. But they uh, even go to the trade deadline. Yeah. They're betting against yourself. The Rudy Gobert trade, they got players and they got picks. What were your mm-hmm. thoughts when that trade happened? I was like, whoa. Oh, that's a, that's a lot. Uh, a lot of picks. That's So uh, I thought it was – I think it's a good move, though. Honestly, too, though, for Minnesota. Like, I really think if it works out, it'll be very interesting. But you're moving Cat to his more natural position and and letting Rudy be able to hold things down defensively inside. The only thing, though, is can Cat defend in crunch time? Can he defend against, you know, those fours, those players who will be playing the four position, which might not necessarily be a power forward. A lot of times we know how the NBA is, it's positionless basketball. So you might have a wing who can handle the rock um playing that spot and now it's cat matched up against him trying mm-hmm. to defend him so we'll see uh how things work out but i'm i'm very intrigued it's kind of taking me back to you know how basketball was how it used to be where you had the, the two bigs the double bigs on the court um so we'll see you know that everybody has has zigged and minnesota's kind of zagging and we'll see if it works out so the value of that trade is now being compared throughout the other these other trade markets now, even with maybe players that we don't even know as you get traded. Do you think that is going to be the basis of any top players getting traded, or do you think that could be the exception to the market with how much the Jazz got back? I think it'll be the exception. Because, um, you know, we've heard about, like, just saying Kevin Durant again. If you think you're going to get that same value and some for Durant in a trade, it's it's just not happening. So... I feel like each trade is going to be its own entity. And with this one, with Gobert, you know, it was just Danny Ainge working his magic and pulled off a move for a team that was very desperate, apparently, to get Rudy Gobert and to pair him up with Cat and Anthony Edwards and see what those guys can make happen as their own kind of big three. But, yeah, I don't think this will be the the how the market will continue to be. Um, when it comes to making trades, you know it's it's so interesting when when you when you look at the league, Chris, and uh, the dominance of some of these younger players like John Morant and uh, even Williamson, who getting the contract that he got this off season, he hasn't played yeah. a game in almost uh, really almost two years. It's it's crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And he got a two hundred million dollar contract. Devin Booker gets a two hundred million dollar contract. Yes. I mean, these two hundred million dollar contracts are getting thrown right now. And and you listen to LeBron James and he says that the game hasn't been better, you know, over the, you know, it's gotten better over the years. And I I think it's gotten worse because of the three point shot. And now everybody has to score, you know, shoot 23s to win a game. Yeah. When you, when you look at the game right now, like you see the stars that are in the league right now, do you think the league has gotten better or gotten worse? I think the talent pool has definitely gotten better. I think there are guys just across the league who can just get buckets who are skilled 
there's a lot of skilled players just down the rosters. I mean, even look at guys like as a Warriors fan, um, I've seen Jordan Poole's ascension. He was somebody that came into the league very raw, um, and he's put himself on the map as somebody that should be getting, you know, is, is uh, going to be very coveted and probably be one of the star players moving forward in the league possibly. But um, I just think the IQ, the application of basketball has fallen off. It's all about the the flashy moves. Guys can do all that stuff. Everybody wants to create their own shot. But when it comes to just the X's and O's and playing basic basketball and making proper reads and maybe not necessarily the flashiest move, but the move that's most efficient and will get you that same two-pointer that you're trying to get, I don't think guys are doing that anymore. So, yeah, the talent level is high, but the actual application and just savvy of uh, playing basketball, I feel like it's dropped off. So in terms of the way teams are structured now, you were talking about it earlier where the ball handlers don't always have to be point guards and stuff like that. Sometimes you see it be the wings. Sometimes you see it be fours. Mm -hmm. I think both the centers and the point guards, there's not a lot of great ones in today's game, and they're not being prioritized as much. Do you see a league now that's more maybe big men shooting and wings really taking over all five positions? Definitely, definitely. Um, it's, I mean, look at the, the Celtics. Um, they ran their offense through Tatum. Tatum is, in today's basketball, he's a four-man, but he was the essentially their point forward. He had a lot of responsibilities when it came to running the offense for them. And we saw it in the finals where he he was struggling because of the attention that the Warriors put on him on defense. So, uh, yeah, I, I definitely feel like, you know, there's less centers. You got guys like, what, Jokic, Embiid, Cat, that you can dump it down to down low and let them post up. But look across the league. Who else are you giving it to at the block and letting them go to work or at the elbow and just say, hey, do you? It's not really what's going on with big men. You set a screen, you roll. Or you spot up in the corner if you have a shot. But uh, besides that, man, you know, centers aren't out here creating offense, which is why we I think we love guys like Jokic so much because they take us back to the mid 2000s mm -hmm. where you had big men who could uh, get buckets. Even the the 90s, of course, with Carl Malone and guys like that on the block. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely very rare. And uh, I agree with you. We are talking to off the ball network NBA analyst and reporter Chris Bolton. Um Russell Westbrook has been a uh, name dangled around. I mean, the L.A. Lakers just didn't work out over there. Uh, if you yeah. look at Russ's numbers, they're not bad. They, they're actually mm -hmm. really good. 18, I think he averaged uh, 9 and 8 or something, almost a du triple-double again this year on a team that obviously uh, – really fell apart this year because of their age. Mm -hmm. LeBron James had one of his better years. It's crazy to say that, but uh, it didn't show because the team sucked. Um, <laughs> when you look at Russell Westbrook and now, t you know, teams are saying that they'll take his contract. If you give us a first round draft pick, is there any team out there that would be interested in taking away our aging player that really just didn't look good last year? In their eyes, they, they didn't look good. I, I I think his numbers show that he he's still a pretty decent player. There there should be. I would think if the Hornets teams that aren't known commodities for getting free agent talent, if you take on that first round pick and you can see what that pick becomes, kind of like um how the Nets were. I talked about the Nets, you know, earlier in our uh, this interview. But when they had D'Angelo Russell, they made that move, taking a chance on players and taking on contracts, getting young talent or a veteran that costs too much mm -hmm. and get a first round pick in the process and trying to build a roster that way. I think a team like the Hornets, maybe the Pistons, someone like that could take him on and get that first round pick as well and continue to see, you know, what you can develop and what young talent you can get in. Because some of these teams just have to know, like, you're not going to get free agents. We know where the free agent, the, the teams that are going to pull those big guys. And it's not normally the Atlanta Hawks, the Detroit Pistons. So teams like that, if you could take on maybe a guy who's past his prime, but get a first round pick or two in the process to eat up that $40 million contract, and you don't think you're going to win that year, why not? It's all about the bigger picture.
So being you're a Warriors fan, one, we've heard Steph Curry reach out to Kevin Durant and try to reunite in Golden State. So do you think, how much leverage do you think that has when Kevin Durant left uh, left for a lot of factors there? And two, what do you think would be a realistic trade package for Kevin Durant to the Warriors, if that's the case? Ooh, realistic? It has to include Wiggins. Um, just, I mean, he's been a good piece. He showed himself to be, honestly, the second best player on a, a title team with how he played this past season and his performance in the finals. So you're going to throw Wiggins in there. Uh, I have to get, I'll have to get Kaminga, uh, Moses Moody. I would try to also get a, a Jordan pool and probably a three, un- you know, two unprotected picks and another uh, protected first. So you'll probably try to get three picks out the deal, but you got to bring in those guys like Kaminga pool. Cause Wiggins isn't enough. You are really selling yourself on the young talent, the Warriors having becoming something. I'm taking Wiseman, Kaminga, all the young pieces from the Warriors, get as many as those guys as I can and contract fillers and let the headline of trade be Andrew Wiggins. That's the kind of move I would look for if that does happen. And what was uh, the first thing you asked about? I was going to ask, like, how realistic do you think that really is? Like, Kevin Durant I, wanting to come back. I really don't think it's realistic at all. I don't I don't see the, the double dip happening. Um, and I, it might sound crazy. I don't want to see it happen. And I'm a Warriors fan, but I love basketball. And I just really don't want to see that happen. I don't want to see this precedent set. Guarantees you a championship again next week. year. It does. It does. But, I mean, if Kevin, this, if Kevin really, like... He might not really care. He's, he's, we've had the, the legacy tweets, but like, you don't uh, care. As he a competitor, it, it just, nah, it just wouldn't sit right with me. And I don't think, I just don't think he wants it that way. I hope he doesn't. So, nah, I don't think it's realistic. I, I don't think it's realistic either, but I, I think Kevin would absolutely open arms, go back to Golden State and win another championship with that team. <laughs> Uh, he'd be the number one option. It wouldn't be Steph. It wouldn't be Clay. It wouldn't be any of those guys. He'd be the number one guy, and he knows it. The only reason why he left there is because he wanted to do it himself, but it just doesn't – It's it, Kyrie, he should have known. Going and playing on a team with Kyrie, mm-hmm. so you're going to have bumps and bruises with him. And in, in, with yes. him, you just don't know what to expect with the guy. I think Kyrie is probably the most talented player in the NBA. I, I – I, if Kyrie just kept his mouth shut and just played the game, I think he's the best player in the league. I The problem with Kyrie is he doesn't shut up, and he just says the things that he says, and he doesn't care of the consequences that come out of his mouth. So mm-hmm. that's the problem with Kyrie. I Everything else, Kyrie fits oh, yeah, anywhere. There. I mean, yeah. he's the number one pick for a reason well, yeah. in his draft. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, like you said, you know, we kind of – we got to – a glimpse of how things could be. We saw how it ended in Cleveland. We saw how it was in Boston. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to pay attention to those things. And, you know, Kyrie, he's he's a lot. He he brings a lot, not just to the game, to the court, but off the court too. And if you aren't built for that, it's going to turn out like it has with, uh, with those two.